Our scripture passage for today is much more than an example of Jesus' being kindness to uh, the little children. It's also an object lesson about the kingdom of God. That lesson being is that the kingdom of God belongs to the weak, to the poor, the hungry, the helpless, the homeless, the unimportant, and the little children. And unless we receive it as such, we will never obtain it. In fact, that is the only way we will obtain it because salvation cannot be earned by wealth or social status or good works. Salvation must be received as a, as a child receives an undeserved gift from God. We'll look at this today as I frame it with some other gospel readings from the weeks leading up to this one. And I'll also make four points about this passage. But first, please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to learn more about your word and ask that you would open our hearts to truly understand it so we can be with you for all of eternity. Be with us now and guide us to truly know you and your will for us that we may share it with others. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll start today's message with a little bit of information on Mark's gospel that'll help put today's reading in a better context for us. It was the first of the four gospels written, and it was the shortest, having only 16 chapters. There's a three-way focus in this gospel, maybe four. It's the proclamation of Jesus as the Christ. Number two, it emphasizes the importance of having faith in him. And three, we are God's children. And a fourth one could be that we should all be servants, as Christ was a servant for us and to us. As we learn in the gospel, the words and works of Jesus demonstrate that he was, in fact, the compassionate and powerful Son of God, come down to earth to die for us on the cross to make atonement for our sin. Another focus on the gospel is to persuade everyone to repent, believe, and have faith, or have the faith of a child. This call to faith is seen in our reading for this morning, and I want to go over that reading again with you, as Jesus tells his disciples to let the little children come to him so we can lay hands on them and bless them. Here it is. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This reading, as you may remember, is a continuation of two other readings, the first one being Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 33 through 37, while they were in Capernaum. It was there that Jesus taught the disciples that the kingdom of God, um, uh, that in the kingdom of God, the weak, the powerless, meaning the children, are most certainly welcome. Here's what it reads, and again, you may remember this from two weeks ago. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking his arms, him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Today's reading also builds off the gospel reading from last week, which is Mark 38 through 40, chapter 9, 38 through 42, where we learn, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be will soon after be afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck 
and he were thrown into the sea. You can see there's a pattern here, as all of these scripture readings mention the little children, meaning us. We are the little children. In 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2, we learn, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason the world did not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is all of this gives us context to unpack our reading for today and to help us do this i've highlighted four points point one who are the children who is bringing them to see jesus and why well, in those days, it was a well-practiced Jewish custom that parents should bring their children or a child to the rabbi for a blessing. And it was most likely the fathers who brought the children. The, the people had no doubt heard the good news that Jesus was in town and they gathered the young to take him for a blessing, kind of like baptism for our children. This practice of bringing children to rabbis for a blessing kind of caused somewhat of a, a, a controversy back then. You see, there was a, a, a raging debate among rabbis as to whether or not children, if they died, would be part of the risen dead. Some said yes, some said no. Some argued that only Jewish children would, would go to heaven if they died. Others argued that all would go, while still others said that the children had to be able to say amen before they would go to heaven. Do you see kind of a familiar pattern here? These are the same beliefs and differences that apply to baptism, and they're seen in Christian denominations all over the world. We're still arguing about this, folks. As to whether or not a child who dies before baptism goes to heaven or not, well, the beliefs vary. Some denominations believe that if a child should die before it is baptized, its soul goes right to hell. Some believe the soul goes to heaven. Well, the truth is, that the Bible isn't clear on this. However, we do have abundant evidence in the Bible to suggest that God has a way of instilling faith in a child so its soul would go to heaven. Here, from our verse 14 today, for instance, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. As to what age or stage in life a child's soul would go to heaven if it died, this speaks right to the belief as to what age a child should be baptized. And as you know from the catechisms and listening to Pastor Paul and myself, as LCMS Lutherans, we strongly believe in infant baptism based on scripture. Other denominations claim that a child should wait until he or she is of the age of understanding. Okay, what is that age? If we waited for that age, there would be far fewer baptized sold souls in this world and far fewer people going to heaven if they should die young. All right, I've kind of beat that one up, haven't I? <laughs> Point two, why did the disciples rebuke them? Why did they try to stop the people from approaching Jesus? Okay, so, I mean, in my head, I have this picture of these hopeful men, <laughs> proud fathers, you know how we are, dads, smiling and all full of joy as they bring their little children to, to Jesus, not just your everyday rabbi, mind you, but Jesus, for a blessing, or trying to at least, and these 12 surly guys form this circle or some sort of posse to protect Jesus, as if he needed protection from a crowd. It's almost like a teenager who brings the most popular and most good-looking girl to the dance, and every other guy in the gym wants to dance with her. And this kid, he's flexing his muscles, you know, he's getting all puffed up, trying to stop them from approaching her. I can just hear the disciples saying to their father, to these fathers, hey, guys, listen, take a walk. This is our Jesus. You can't have him. Besides, he's busy right now. Now go away, you bother me. And, and there's Jesus, hand to his forehead, just shaking his head. Oh, Lord, I am Lord. Guys, hello, is anyone home? Hello. He became indignant, and for a really good reason, if you ask me, the disciples, they just still weren't getting it. After all they had witnessed, after all they had heard, they're just not getting it. They still don't understand his teachings and his purpose here on earth. 
Now, I'm not wanting to say that the, the, the disciples were mean-spirited or ungracious men, but their eyes were still closed. They were still blind. Their ears were still deaf. And they were simply thinking in earthly terms instead of seeing this whole situation through the eyes of Jesus, the Lord and Savior of all. After his rebuke, I can just imagine the disciples kind of milling about with their heads down, still looking sad because, well, they'd just been scolded by Jesus in front of the whole crowd. And I wonder if they felt embarrassed about this. I wonder if in this moment they learned something about humility. I mean, for crying out loud, they're supposed to be Jesus' disciples and act like him. But once again, here we see the disciples standing in the way of people trying to approach Jesus. In their defense, and this is the only defense, I, dis I suppose the disciples displayed a natural response to try to stop the people from going to Jesus because, after all, he was important and he had important work to do and they thought it was their job to stop these people from approaching guard, uh, standing guard. Wrong. <laughs> Point three, the response by Jesus speaks to his great love and compassion for children and for all people for that matter. Listen to the second part of verse 14 again, and this is beautiful. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. In my humble opinion, these are the key words of this scripture passage because they speak not only to the little children, but to all children at any age. We're all God's children, created in his beautiful image. That's what he means by the words, such as these, such as us. Who are these? Who are us? The poor, the needy, the weak, the helpless, the homeless, those in financial uh, need, those without high social status, status. That's us, folks. The kingdom of God belongs to such as people as these, such as us doesn't include people who think they can purchase their way into heaven and buy their salvation by making huge donations. It doesn't include people who light a few candles, say a few perfunctory prayers, and then trot off on their merry way thinking they're saved because after all they've prayed and lit candles. It's for the people of real faith who know that they are sinners and want the gifts that Jesus has to offer. Eternal life, eternal salvation, such as us. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, you know this from your catechism. For by grace you have been saved through, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Folks, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord. Point four. Verse 15 is a true teaching moment. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. How can anyone who is puffed up with pride, pushing about with his ego for his own benefit, not caring about or helping God's people enter his kingdom to enter those narrow gates of heaven's entrance? I'll tell you how. Pure, unadulterated arrogance. That's how. A good example of arrogance is King Amaziah in 2 Chronicles 25. At the age of 25, Amaziah was named the ninth king of Judah, which is the lower kingdom, succeeding his father who was killed by assassins. Amaziah was very careful to listen to God's prophet who told him, you don't need an army of 100,000 mercenaries to go into battle against Edom because God is with you and will give you everything you need. So putting his full faith in God, he told the mercenaries to go away. He relied on God and he won a key battle. That's when the bottom fell off, folks. Because after that key battle, Amaziah started to believe his own press clippings. He let his ego, his pride, and his arrogance get the best of him. He became puffed up, even to the point of, get this, not just rejecting God, but worshiping false gods of the enemy he had just conquered. Well, guess what? He was eventually killed by assassins also after losing a key battle. 
all because of his pride and his ego. Amaziah had been lulled into a false sense of superiority. This isn't the person, the kind of person that Jesus is referring to when he says, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is trying to get his disciples to open their blinded eyes. He's trying to impart knowledge and wisdom to them that will turn their hearts. And each of the three readings that I referenced today point to that, and it's a teaching moment for the disciples and for us. So what about us? How many times have we become puffed up with pride, arrogance, ego? I know I have. I'll admit it to you right now. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I did community theater. I know what ego is. <laughs> Too many times for me to think about it. We see, see people like this all around us every single day of our lives, and sometimes it drives us mad. In our sinful human nature, many times we're moved to want to retaliate. But that's not the way, folks. The best way is to pray. Pray not only for ourselves, but pray to God. And pray for those around us, that he would bless us, as he did these little children in verse 16. Because this verse delivers a promise of hope for all of us. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. You know, I, I, I do a lot of research for the sermons. And I, I'm learning so much. And while I was doing research for this particular sermon, this scripture passage kept running through my head over and over. And it was driving me nuts. Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40. I'll share it with you. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I couldn't figure out why this was bothering me. I would look at it, stare at it, think about it, and then go back to the sermon writing. Then I'd come back to it. I'd look at it again. Then I'd pray about it. And finally, that Holy Spirit bolt of lightning kind of struck me in the head as to why this passage was on my mind. Jesus saw each disciple he called as a child who was naked, hungry, thirsty, and in prison, and on and on. Naked to be clothed with the robe of God's righteousness. Hungry for the love of God. Thirsty for the life-giving, life-saving water that only God can provide. Needing to be released from the prison of this world, and so on and so on. He not only called them and rescued them, but folks, he chose us his children for the same purpose. He calls us. He makes us his own. We are his and he is ours. And because of that, we never have to worry about things in this world because he reassures us throughout the Bible. But take heart, I am always with you, John 16, 33. And I am with you till the end of the world, Matthew 28, verse 20. Comforting words for his children in a world gone completely mad. Folks, he doesn't come for the well-off, the well-coiffed, the rich, those with high status. He comes for us, his little children who are in constant need of his love, his kindness, his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness. Things he holds in his hands and wants us to have so we can be with him forever. I want you to imagine for a second here, if we had been standing in that crowd that day and witnessed him wrapping his arms around the children, smiling, laughing, playing, blessing them. Now imagine him doing the same to us every new morning. And the good news is, we don't have to imagine it because for the faithful, he does this every day of our lives. Each new day is like being baptized all over again as a child. He takes us in his arms and blesses us, his children. He protects us from the evils of this world. Pride, 
Ego and arrogance are a stumbling block to so many, but through him, through his deep love for us, these foolish attributes will be stripped away and we will feel his loving hands on our heads and hear those words, come to me, my little child, you will not be hindered for my kingdom belongs to such as you. Amen. Amen. May that peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and life everlasting. Amen.